Welcome everybody. My name is Manuela Del Forno. And I'm Bob O'Kennan and we're at the Botanical Research Institute of Texas here in Fort Worth. Yes, and today we are at SWANIP, which stands for? The Southwest Nature Preserve, <laughs> right on the edge of Kennedale Mountain. The highest mountain in the area. Yeah, and we're here. Go ahead. 80, 83 feet from the parking lot. Oh, that's yeah. Kenneth. That's what's the name of it? Cannondale Mountain. Okay, that's good to know. 83 feet. All right. Yeah. We climbed a mountain today. I didn't know that. Yes. That's great. Okay. Uh, so we're here in Arlington in the Dallas Metroplex area. And today we're going to be learning a little bit more about lichens, what they are what they have, or especially what are some of the characters that you can use to identify them in the field, and just more generally also showing you some lichens from this region. So we're looking at lichens here on this rock, and they're all different sorts. Can you tell us a little bit about what they are? Absolutely. So for lichens, the if you get, for example, a guide or something, you see that is generally divided into parts are the overall lichen appearance or lichen growth. And there are three main types, uh, folios, fruticles, and crustals. And of course, there are some uh, lichens in between, but we'll focus first on learning about the fruticles type. And um, in this example right here, in this the genus Teloschistis, and but there are several other genera in the area as well, Romalina, Usnium, and they are characterized by having sort of like a 3D appearance, if you think about that. They could be shrubby, hairy, and they're usually uh, completely uh, or just very loosely attached to the substrate, and it would be very easy to remove them. So, for example, uh, in this one that you see right here growing, it's just right there and it has uh, multiple colors. So once you realize, okay, this is the fruticose type, then you can look at other characteristics. Other types include probably the most typical uh, growth form that you see here in this area, which are uh, crustose lichens. And they are very closely attached to, uh, in this example, the rocks. And just by in this small area here, we can already see multiple different lichens. For example, there is this one in yellow, one in orange, one in gray. They're all types of crustose lichens. To remove a crustose lichen, you need to bring a piece of the substrate with you. And in uh, trees, that might be a little bit uh, easier. You know, you just have a good knife and a hammer, while in the rock, you'll need a uh, better equipment such as a uh, chisel. Does it grow into the rock? I mean, they literally into it? They could grow into the rock, and in that case, they could be considered endolytic lichens endolithic, because, yes, yeah, they will yes. be sort of growing rock. a little bit, and they do that by, again, the hyphae will be going into the like rock. They penetrate into the rock. Mm -hmm. And I have another question on request, and that mm -hmm. is, um, do lichens have the ability with acid to dissolve rock or create soil? Yes, and that is one of the most important uh, functions of lichens, that they deposit these enzymes that create this microhabitat, creating this dust that while before nothing could be growing there, now you have pioneer species, especially lichens and other uh, cryptogams especially, like uh, bryophytes. Okay. And uh, we can actually see a, a lot of them here on this rock, and I'll show you later. But first, let's talk about the third type of main lichen growth forms, which is folios. And that is, I think, what people usually think about lichens, is this like big, fluffy lichens growing on trees especially. And they have this uh, appearance here. You know, there's usually this gray and greenish colors, but there are, of course, many different types of lichens uh, with this aspect. And they can uh, also be variable about how much they can be attached to the substrate. 
but most of the times it's uh, fairly easy to remove just with a butter knife or something like that. Okay, so how to recognize a folio's lichen? It's usually by their leafy appearance. You can think about a lattice and usually folio's lichens will have lobes that are uh, either partially or totally attached to the substrate or sometimes just by a few points. But again, it's fairly easy to remove because of this more or less ruffled appearance. And we'll get to see uh, a few different uh, lichen species here today. And instead of giving you the fish and give you all the lichen names, I'd rather give you a lot of um, explanations of the characters so you can learn more about lichens and not only identify lichens here but wherever you go so we'll get to see some of those right now another uh, folios lichens uh, growing on rocks in this area is this uh, xanthoparmelia right here and i wouldn't dare tell you which species it is because there are over 50 species in north america and there are several characters that are important for this genus. Um, first of all, they grow on rocks and they usually have these uh, you no know, yellow greenish appearance and that's because of the presence of osnic acid. And the main characters for this group is uh, how adnate or how attached they are to the rocks that they're growing on. The color of the lower surface, as I mentioned before. Uh, also, the types of uh, Isidia, which is another uh, reproduction mode. I showed you before the Soridia. So this genus has Isidia, which again has the combo package as a Soridia, but an Isidia has a finger-like, so very small protuberances that will break off and start a new lichen. And lastly, chemistry. And chemistry is going to be very important for this group. And we can talk more about uh, chemistry uh, just by showing uh, this uh, rock right here. You can probably already start noticing that there are several different colors. And do you know why is that? Well, we're wondering. <laughs> uh -huh. So lichens can have a thousand different chemical compounds, most of them unique to lichens. And for me, that's one of people ask, what do you think is most interesting about lichens? And I say, well, how long do you have? But <laughs> this is one of my main questions because I do believe, and there's a lot of research to back me up here, that a lot of these compounds can be utilized in several different areas of research and including for as natural pesticides, for cancer research and so forth. Just by looking here, you can start noticing then that there are some gray lichens and they could have uh, different acids or not. You would have to look further in the lab, but most evident here will be this yellow lichen here, which is an Acarospora and they have pulvinic acid and the other uh, common lichen here is in the genus Caloplaca and they have uh, antrachinones and again is that they, a pigment? What it said? is, uh, yeah. So there are different mm -hmm. pigments and yes. uh, acids, and the, sometimes there are different groups that may look very similar. And then with a spot test, or even with a more advanced test like thin layer chromatography, then you can separate what are some of these compounds. But they are very, very important for lichen identification. So even here, some, there are a couple of different. Uh, so this is a crustose, these are crustose lichens, but there are folios lichens that also have these different pigments and colors. Uh, a few examples for exa uh, of these uh, reactions that I was talking about is just uh, commonly used uh, spot tests. So you might start seeing those in these books, in these guides. And there are two main ones. One is C, which is just your household bleach. 
they can have reactions usually in the pink and reds. So if you see, for example, C plus or C positive red, it means that if you put a little drop of bleach into the lichen and it's going to tell you what part of the lichen, either the cortex, the outside, or the medulla, the inside, then it has a positive reaction to that. The other one is the K test, and that is uh, potassium hydroxide, and they usually have uh, a different uh, array of <coughs> color palette, and those are yellow and uh, oranges, but also when uh, in these uh, orange lichens, they could react a very like purple, a very bright color, and With those are going to be very important then for identifying these specific pigments and acids. Can you do those tests out in the field, or is that something you need to bring back? Um, you could, as long as you remove the little piece that you tested, because you don't want it spreading out. And the same oh, yeah. thing for yeah. the herbarium. If you do those tests in the herbarium, you always want to remove that part too, yeah. because let's say that in uh, hundreds of years when someone else is going to look at this again, you don't know what technologies are gonna be available and then you're suddenly gonna see a different color in the lichen. Yeah, makes and perfect sense. Wow. Uh, we've seen several stained lichens and you don't really know if it happened before, you know, or something mm -hmm. happened during the desiccation. So it's, uh, you take out a little piece, you test it and then you, you discard that. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, mm -hmm. great. And, um, if you are wondering, do we know a lot about these pigments and acids, what they're there for? It's, uh, there's some ongoing studies that at least for some of these antraquinones, so this orange uh, acid and this group of um, chemical compounds, they can, they, they're frequently found in areas that has a lot of sun exposure and they are uh, protecting then the lichen for like a sunscreen for us. So humans. they absorb the dangerous radiation and protect. It, yes, the and protecting the yeah. lichen inside its components, especially Is that the, the orange photobiont. One we're talking about now? Is that yes. We're talking so about? this orange one right here, and it's known as caloplaca. caloplaca. And there are actually several segre segregated genera now in this group. But uh, they're, you know, you can, that's a starting name, as I say, Caloplaca, they're crustals, they're orange, and then you can go from there. Got it. Let me ask you one more question. I'm wondering if that is analogous to what I see in plants. You notice in the spring sometimes some new shoots are coming out and with certain like oak leaves when they first uh, start growing have orange or red in there. And I read in one book or mm -hmm. other, that those pigments are produced early because the tender new growth is very susceptible mm -hmm. to the radiation and it serves to protect them? Yeah, I, I actually similar... don't know. It could be similar. I just don't know if the same genes are involved. Or if it's just you know? an analogous process. For yeah, it's because yeah. the um, the acids and pigments, they are produced by the microbiome. So the fungi is the one that is producing uh, oh. these parts. So oh, okay. not the the algae, which would be then closely related to plants. So it could be something yeah, completely, that, yeah. you know, unrelated, but it could also be convergent evolution in different mm -hmm. groups of organisms. That makes sense. Well, you're out there looking for lichens. You're also going to see a lot of things that are not lichens. And really the best way to get used to all of these different uh, organisms is just to go out there and start uh, observing and try to identify them. Uh, the most probably uh, confusing group for most people are going to be uh, bryophytes. And Bob has some here to show. Uh, so, so the bryophytes, these are, this is a moss. And a lot of mosses are like this. Be, but these are just flat against this. And they're, they're very dry. They can handle really dry weather. Okay, mm -hmm. so, but this is a bryophyte, but it's really fuzzy. Here, here's the stuff right here, mm -hmm. but uh, and these you will find several species of bryophytes or mosses on rocks, depending on how, how much moisture they get and everything. So while we're here, let's uh, take a look at this lichen that is uh, very common, especially here at Swanif, right, Bob? Right. We've seen so many, and is this uh, stone wall rim lichen, or the scientific name is Protoparmeliopsis muralis. And it's one of those um, 
like us that you're like, is it crustose? Is it folios? Uh, some people describe it as placodioid, and you can see it's um, still crustose because to remove it, you would have to take out a piece uh, out of the rock, uh, out of the rock, excuse me. But at the borders, you see it's elongated, looking like a folios lichen. So uh, again, these uh, appearances of lichens are important more for understanding, but then you really have to look into other characteristics to find to what group it belongs to. For me, it's always fascinating just to uh, look at a rock like this and see so many different types of lichens. You immediately see some of the ones we already saw, like the stone wall, uh, rim lichen, the caloplacas, the orange ones. There's also this yellow here, the gold speck lichen, the Candela candelariella, excuse me. But the one that I really want to show you here is this uh, Aspicilia, is the name of the genus. And it has these sunken discs. And uh, to see that, you really need good hand lines. One of the, my favorite tricks is that Sometimes you can even get the small microscopes for your phone. And I mean, the phones are just so great quality these days. What I really like to do is just to put my hand lenses and then try to take a picture through these lenses. And look how it actually works really well. Just to Wow, find... I can see it from here. Yeah, right? So sometimes you're trying to see what kind of structures there are and then um, for iNaturalist, for example, this is ideal because it, otherwise it will be really hard to know what genus this is. There are, trust me, there are so many different lichens that have this overall appearance that is just um, a white or gray crustose lichens with uh, black or, you know, just dark apothecia. So knowing these little tricks and having good hand lenses can be really you need helpful. to get in close. Is yes. that just a jeweler's loop or is that a particular a botanical lens? What is that? Uh, this is a botanical lens. This is made by a lichenologist, but there are several ones that you can just buy online and the jewelers that what can have. That? Uh, what, what this the... one is a 10X. Mm -hmm. Something between 10 and 20 can already be really helpful. You don't have to pay really expensive, okay. uh, expensive, but you know, you can get something really good for 20 bucks. Ideally, okay. they would have lights because mm -hmm. a lot of the times you will be casting a shadow if you're leaning towards, uh, for example, here is a very good angle, but if you're against a tree, sometimes you'll be making a shadow. It's blocking the light. So light is really... So a built-in uh, light on that is, yeah, I see. It's really incredible. And there are several other hand lenses that have lights. Okay. So that's really incredible. And the last lichens that I would like to show uh, you is this group Fisiaceae, and they are uh, usually this microfolios lichens and the main difference is that you can see that they have very narrow lobes and that's one of the characteristics of this uh, family. There are several different genera that occur in the area, Fisia, Girinaria, and the ones that we are seeing here, the lighter one is the hoary rosette lichen. So rosette lichens are usually um, assigned to this genus Fisia. It's completely covered in macula, which makes this whitish appearance. And macula, we learned at the very beginning about Pseudocephala, which are the white dots. Macula, are, they can have a different shapes, but it's usually uh, this white gnat and it's giving that uh, aspect because it's an interruption in the photobiont layer. Yes. So when there is a photobiont layer interruption, it doesn't look greenish, it just looks white. You're just seeing the white fun. Yeah, so fun and it can occur in several different groups of lichens. Okay. And it's uh, in this uh, species, uh, Fisia ipolia, is very common and very uh, prominent. All right, so. Well, this is a wonderful place, the Southwest Nature Preserve is about, uh, I think it's 68 acres, and it's uh, with the big Kennedale Mountain back here, which we haven't seen. But I've been, I've been working out here for uh, probably 25 years. Uh, 
fact, I was one of the ones that preserved this place with the city of Arlington. And I've been around it many, 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 many times, hundreds of times in all the pathways. And it takes, it's a, there are a lot of paths. And I see things out here that we haven't seen and you won't see today because every single path has something different on it, which makes it a very interesting place. Mm -hmm. and, and this is one of the most interesting places because these big uh, uh, sandstone, sandstone boulders are just loaded with very, very interesting, unusual lichens. That's why we brought you up here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and then the, so lichens are very specific in uh, where they grow so different rocks can and will have different lichen species and so will be different the species that we saw on the trees. And uh, in habitats or parks that then the more different substrates that you have, most likely you'll see also more different uh, species of lichens. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, let's also talk about why are lichens important? And we talked a little bit about how they can be used for research and for humans. A lot of different cultures eat lichens as well. But for the environment, there are over 50 species of birds in the United States, or excuse me, in North America that utilize lichens for building their nests, for example. There are even some small mammals that can do the same. Lichens are also very important for uh, primary succession and they can be you know also home for a lot of different invertebrates and uh, I can just keep going on and on but mm -hmm. most importantly we also wanted to finish by thanking you for spending your time with us and being willing to learn uh, more about lichen so we hope you've enjoyed your time with us very bye much. bye thank, thank you thank you beautiful thank you very so good. much really appreciate it it's wonderful and then I'm going to talk about these two here, then these, and then here.